Thanks for joining me this week. Recently, I spoke a message at Community Bible Chapel. It was about the outlandish love of God. You know, the world talks a lot about love, but do they really understand it? The truth is, most people, although we say so much about love, we certainly don't understand the love of God. Would you join me this week for this wonderful lesson? Because I'm going to give you some examples of God's love and what it can mean to us. Here's our program. Thanks for joining us this week. So take your Bible and turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and uh, I've called this outlandish love. You'll notice <clears throat> in that chapter, verse 1, <clears throat> Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now, notice that's present tense, <clears throat> beloved, now are we the children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, that's future, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. I like that phrase, what manner of love. Because really, it's the idea of uh, uh, love from another country. Have you ever seen somebody come from another country and, um, and they dress kind of strange? I'm looking at you guys. I said, you, they, you look strange because you're dressed, not that you're strange. DJ? Yeah, well, okay. No, uh, from time to time... People come here, you know, and they, they wear a flowered shirt or something, and, and, you, and you just kind of smile and say, oh, boy, you know, that's what they wear in Turkey, but not here. And so, but we give him a pass, okay? So it means dress from another country, or in this case, love from another country. It's outlandish love. It, it's the kind of love that, that you wish you could experience, but it's so foreign, so foreign to our thinking today, because we overuse the word love. You know, for example, someone says, I love pickles. Well, a couple of you like pickles, I can tell. And, and so, but, but you don't love them in that, in the sense of loving, it just means you like them on a sandwich. Are you with me? I don't think you get this at all. I love watermelon. But... I just eat it, you know, three times a day, I'm satisfied. I love Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I drink it 10 times a day, I'm satisfied. You see, so don't use the word love in the wrong way. This is, behold, what outlandish love. Today, I, I want to talk to you about outlandish love. It's something that's so, it's so foreign to how we live today and think today that you may not even understand it, but this is the kind of love that God has for us. And it's love that's out of this world. And I want to begin by, by talking about a, a story that's from the, I'm not going to say it right, Ken, Ken Wadi? Kenny Wadi. Yeah, it's, it, there's an African story of this. There's a Ken Wadi. And it, it talks about an African bride. And there's several versions of the story. I'm going to tell you the one that I printed out. Coach and I have enjoyed this story. And uh, I actually printed one out for him because we don't have the details right. But there's probably more than one version of the story. But it's a, it's a legend. And um, in many African cultures, uh, the standard price for a bride was two healthy, well-fed cows. That'll flatter you, won't it, ladies? That's nothing in Israel. It used to be a, a camel. And, uh, but not many men could afford two healthy cows. And so it was really an, an honor when a young man would go to a, a girl's house and, and offer to pay the full dowry to healthy cows for a girl. 
That meant that he was really serious. But in a certain village, there was a, a plain lady. That's the polite way of saying it. How we would describe her if you're an East High alumni, you would say she was ugly. And, uh, and so it was always also customary that the oldest girl would get married first. But she was so plain or ugly that her three younger sisters got married first. And it was just, uh, wow, it, it was so embarrassing to this poor girl. And actually, it was even humiliating to the parents. And so they, in their mind, they gave up the hope that she would ever find someone to marry her. And finally, the father, in desperation, said, you know what? If someone will come and, and marry her, I'll give them four cows. Well, you can imagine what this did to this poor girl's reputation. And um, so she began to move from village to village. And in their mind, they knew that she was going to grow up an old maid and die an old maid. And one day, a stranger appeared at the door. And he was from far away. And he went to the father. And, and when the father heard that, that there was a pursuer for her, he said, I'm not, going, I'm not going one step higher than four cows for her. He said, no, no. He says, that's not what I'm here to bargain about. He said, I came here to offer you eight cows for your daughter. And the father, trying to be an honest man with integrity, said, uh, have you looked at her? <laughs> he said, no. He said, I, I, I don't need to see her. I'll deliver the cows the next morning. And you can only imagine that when this man actually paid eight cows for this girl, how, what happened in all the other households around there? The, the girl said, how come you didn't give eight cows for me? Am I not worth eight cows? I mean, and, Wow. Outlandish love. You see, if we're not careful, we begin to think of love in the same standard that, that we do in this country. And so today, what I want to do, I want to talk to you about a couple other love stories. And I know you know the stories, but we'll go through them because there's some of the details that I think are important. But I want to talk to you today about outlandish love. L love that's, that's so different than the way we use the word love today. But it's the way that, that God would use it. So if you'll take your Bibles, turn with me now to, to the book of Ruth. <coughs> Ruth's a little book, four chapters. Chapter 1, verse 1. It came to pass in those days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went out to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his sons. We'll, we'll stop there for just a moment because it's, it's really interesting that the story would begin like that. You see, here's what we know about the background of the story. It takes place during the days of the judges. And remember that at that time, Joshua died. And as soon as Joshua died... The, the people of Israel said, okay, who's going to fight for us? Because Joshua was a warrior. And what took place after Joshua, then, then it was a cycle of the judges. And it was a, a cycle that just kept going. There, there would be, they would adhere to God's word. They would do things their own way. Rebellion would come. Sin would come. And then there would be uh, repentance <laughs> and changing and restoration and and the next generation would come, and guess what? They would live the same way. And to me, it's, it's interesting, because if you go to, to Deuteronomy chapter 7, you read what God says. He says, here is how I want you to love, or how I want you to live. And if you'll live this way, I promise that I will bless you. And so among the things that he did, he said, I need you to take the people and, and destroy them. Sounds harsh. Because they've rejected God. And I'm so pure and I'm so holy, I, I can't have people serving another God. Wow, what, what would happen if he were to give those rules to us today? Because you know what? We're bent on serving other gods, aren't we? Matter of fact, I just watched a, a tape this week on AI. And AI has a whole tape out, 10 or 12 minutes long. And it says, I am the creator, I am the sustainer, I am the healer, I, wow, stealing it from God? I think I showed you a video clip of a, a pastor that said 
He doesn't need a, a miracle work in God. He says, I am the miracle. And, and you know what? Carelessly, we, we, God's going to judge that, isn't he? And so God began to judge Israel. And it was a painful judgment. And, uh, but I want us to read one little phrase, one little verse in, in Leviticus chapter 26. And uh, I'll read it to you if you don't have your, your Bible handy. Leviticus 26, verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in the due season. And the land shall yield her increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Now, the reason I, I do read that one, because, you see, here's what happened. All of a sudden, the land that, that God gave to Israel because they compromised on his standards. You know, God means what he says, doesn't he? We, we don't take God at his word. We're, we're perfectly willing to pick and choose out of God's word what we want to do. And God said, no. He said, I'll bless you if you'll obey me. But he said, if you choose to rebel against me, he said, that, that's a choice that you have. God gives us a, a free will, doesn't he? And Israel chose to rebel. They, they not only compromised by allowing the people to, to live among them, but they began to give their daughters and, and sons to them to marry. And they not only allowed their children to marry them, but they began to set their idols up to worship and finally, God says, I have no choice. I have to judge you. And one of the ways that he did that was he, he stopped the rain. And when there was no rain, well, there was no crops. And before long, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, there was a famine in the land. It's interesting because, you see, the house, or Bethlehem, he was from Bethlehem. Do you recognize that city? If not, you'll recognize it in a moment. But Bethlehem really means house of bread. Isn't it? crazy that in the house of bread there would be a famine do you see the paradox yeah and of all places there, there should have been food it should have been in Bethlehem and so here's what takes place as you look at the names it really tells quite a story but Elimelech said this I'm not going to put up with this famine why should I do that I'm going to move. I'm going to move out of the promised land, and I'm going to go to the land of Moab. Moab was the enemy of Israel. Now, I won't go into to why they're the enemy of Israel, but, but there's a long history of it. There was, not, there was not good relationships between Israel and Moab. Today, it would be Jordan and Israel. There's still not good relationships. But what is important, I think, is the fact that, that rather than find out what's the reason for the famine, he decides he'll move. Every once in a while, you know what we say? I'll pout. I don't like what God says. You're going to discipline me? I'll move. You ever, you ever pout? These guys don't. Yeah, all of us pout. Yeah. And so, he moves. Elimelech means this. Whose God is king? Naomi, her name means pleasantness, plenteous and pleasant. They named their boy Sick. I don't know about you, but man, of all the names, sick, yeah, and the other one's pining. He must have been a pain in the neck, huh? And, and, and they have these two boys. He's running from God, and all of a sudden, you know what God decides to do? God does this. He takes Elimelech, and he dies. The two boys die. But before they die, they marry Moabite girls. Now, Moabite girls, it was, it was unusual when a girl would be past eight years old that she wasn't married. Old maid, 12. These were teenagers. I don't know how long it was before God took their life, but I can tell you this, these, these girls were young. And so somehow, in the midst of all this confusion, they saw something in Naomi. And by the way, she changes her name from from plenteous and pleasantness to bitter. You know, that can happen to people when they're under the discipline of God, can it? And so these two daughter-in-laws, they come to her. They say, you know what? We really don't want to stay in Moab. We, we've seen enough, even in your condition, that, that we, want to, we want to go with you back to Israel because guess what happened? During the course of this time, the story came that there's bread 
in Bethlehem. And, and so Mara or Naomi says, why am I living here? I, I might as well go back to the, to the house of bread. I might as well go back. God always welcomes his people back, doesn't he? And so the great thing about it was this, that both Orpha and Ruth said, we're going back with you. Matter of fact, you know what? Orpha, she, she says, hey, I, I'm going to go back. And Naomi said, wait a minute, look, I'm so old, I can't have another child. Because, you see, in those days, if your husband died, you waited for his brother. That's a happy thought. And she said, I, I don't have any more kids in me. So if, if you're sticking around so that you'll have a, a brother to marry you, I ain't got no brothers. I ain't got no kids coming. And Orpha says, no, 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 we, we love you. And she makes a big show of it. She kisses her. Wow. And Ruth, she clings to her. But Orpha said, you know, I just remembered. I got some homework to hand in. I, I'm just going to go back and say hi, bye to, to dad and mom and, you know, get my computer and a few things and my phone and uh, she never comes back oh I've seen people that make a lot of profession of love for God Jesus was betrayed by a kiss wasn't he and Orpha Orpha's love was not sincere but, but Ruth was quite different Ruth committed herself and, and she said listen she says Naomi, if you're going back, she said, I'm going to go back with you. And finally, when it, the Bible says this, when she saw that she was steadfastly determined, when she saw that she, she couldn't change her mind, she says, okay, come. And here's what Ruth said. He says, she, she said to Naomi, your God will be my God, and your ways will be my ways. And so Naomi says, come. And then we come to chapter 2. And, um, and so and, in chapter 2, there's, there's several things about this that we want to look at. And I think we're going to, for the sake of time, we're going to go here. You see, on the way back, I can see uh, Ruth talking to Orpha saying, Wow, you know, how, how, how do we make a living there? And I think Naomi must have said, Well, we've got a crazy custom. You see, our custom, here it is for you in Deuteronomy chapter 24. It says that, that when someone harvests a field, if you leave some grain there, don't go back and pick it up. It's for the foreigners and for the widows and, and for the fatherless. And then there, there's another one, God's plan for widows. It's in Leviticus chapter 19. And it says that when you reap the, the field, well, leave the corners because that way, you talk about an incredible program for those that need food. There it is. One of the things I like about it, you've got to do a little work to get it. And so in Ruth's mind, on her way back, walking from Moab to, to Bethlehem, she said, okay, maybe, maybe I, I guess I'll be a gleaner. And guess what's going through Mara, Bitter's mind? Oh, girl, you don't know what you just said. Let me tell you that on the top 100 jobs, Gleaner was 101. It, it was the worst job you could have. And, but the next morning, guess what? She says, okay, I'm going to glean. And so now we, we find ourselves all the way over in chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Or, uh, or, no, chapter 1, verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned out of the country of Moab, they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. And Naomi had a kinsman of her, of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. See the word kinsman there? We're going we're gonna to work on that word kinsman before we're done. And so Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of grain after him in whose side I shall find grace. And Naomi said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred, different word, the kindred of Elimelech. Now, let me tell you this, that a sovereign God has a plan. 
I'm convinced that you have a will to accept Christ or to refuse him. But let me tell you that, that God is working overtime to make you exposed to the gospel. Matter of fact, you'll have to avoid it. So some of you probably came to sunrise and you were thinking, I came here for basketball. And nope. You came here to hear about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't care if you ever dunk it, even a donut, but I don't want you to go to hell. And so God put in your mind that just because your brother could play basketball, that you could play basketball, and I look at him and say, oh, that, pew, uh, that, uh, that water, uh, he needs Jesus. So come on, come, yeah. This boy does know Jesus. And some of you come from Burma. And I know the mindset of people in Burma, and some of you know Jesus Christ, and some of you, you're not sure. You know how come I know? I read your eyes, and your eyes don't lie. But when you hear the story of God's outlandish love, you won't be able to refuse it. And, and so here's God. And, and God's working. Because, because Ruth moved in the direction of saying, I, I like God. I, I went, I'm going to submit myself to God. I've, I've gone through a, a tough time. I grew up in Moab, a horrible place to grow up. I married a man. He's already dead. I've got no future. And I'm going to go back and live in Israel. And accept whatever God deals me. And the Bible says, and she just happened. Do you think that was an accident she got there? No. I think God maybe had to move roads and farms a hundred years in advance to make it so that'd be the first place she went to. And so I can see Ruth as she comes back and she says, Naomi, I'm going I'm to glean today. And Naomi says, well, I was hoping you'd take a week. She said, no, no, I, I want to try it. She said, it, it sounds like fun. Oh, boy. Do you know what, you know what gleaning meant? It meant when everyone was harvesting the field, you went out there and, and because they took most of the grain, you stoop down like this. I know I'm out of camera view. And you grab a whole bunch of dirt and grain. I mean, a whole handful. And, and you go. <laughs> and out of a handful of dirt, you get four or five pieces of grain. You put it in your bag. You do it again. By noon, guess what your face looked like? Yep, you got it. And, and not only that, on the social ladder, the gleaner wasn't the highest person. Because if you saw a gleaner, you know what would be fun to do? Just kind of trip them or push them or maybe make it so they spill their grain and they got to start the whole process again. Wow. How many would like to glean for a living? Rahim, is that your hand going? No, okay, yeah. To feed a body like that, you'd yeah, I'd take three bushel baskets full. Um, and, 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 and so Ruth says, wow, look at that. I, I got five grains. And guess what? About that time, I mean, just to show you how, how God works. And I, I want you to know that God works because you know what? You didn't, you didn't come here from Japan for no reason at all. God directed you. I don't even know where you're from. Are you from China or America? You're a hybrid. Yeah. Where are you from? Africa. Where? Where? Rwanda. Yeah, Rwanda. Man, God had to move some things to get him here. Kristen, where are you from? Columbia. Columbia. How many times you move? Just once, yeah. Escaped the drugs. Got to sunrise. Thinks he's a basketball player. Yeah. Got to turn him into an evangelist. Why? Because God's moving things. And so, so, I mean, there she is, and she's gleaning. And all of a sudden, on a white horse, you can always tell the good guy by the white horse, Boaz rides up on a white horse, and he says to the, his workers, he said, hey, God bless you. Wow. How many bosses say, God bless you? And they say, God bless you. And as he kind of gets a little status report, he says, uh, by the way, he says, uh, who's the, who's the new girl? They say, we haven't noticed. He says, no, you know, the, the good-looking one. Oh. Well, she's from, she's from Moab. 
that's, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. And she's gleaning. Boaz takes another look and says, hmm, I think I'll welcome her to the field. Rides over there. And all of a sudden, Ruth is kind of embarrassed. First of all, she can tell by the horse that he's the boss. Second, it looks like she's looking right at her. And third, she noticed he's handsome. And he says, hey, I, I've heard about you. I, I heard that, that, that you're moving back from Moab and, and you committed yourself to, to Naomi and to the God of Naomi and the ways. And he said, may, may, may the Lord bless you. He says, matter of fact, he said, my workers have dinner at my house at noon. Would you come? You know what she said? Oh, no, I'm going to Taco Tico. Well, the world talks about love, but it's not like God's love. In the world, love is either a getting love or a giving love. Usually in the world, it's a getting love. We, we try to get all we can. We say we love someone, we get all we can from them. But God is so different. God's a giving love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Today, I invite you to receive Christ as your personal savior because God loved you. and He gave Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. What a God that would love us. Even though we've sinned, God loved us. He sent his son to die on the cross that we could have eternal life. Today, receive him as your savior. And then join me next week as we conclude our story of outlandish love. Mm -hmm.